All right, we'll start with lightning talks. Uh, I don't know what they are, but uh, they're in a line, and so they're just going to talk, tell you who they are and what they're talking about. All right, I'm uh, David Brady, and uh, my timer is now behind his. Crap. Oh, well. All right, so uh, last year, my New Year's resolution was to ship code every single day. And it was pretty awesome, actually. Um, I never wanted for a lightning talk at uh, any of the rugs. Uh, I started about 30 projects on GitHub. Uh, I did a lot of con contributing to other stuff. And it was, it was a really, really good experience. I didn't go all year. I ended the experiment about 115 days in. I didn't give up. I just decided I've learned what I've, I want from this, and I'm done. So I'm sorry with you guys. I'm going to tell you uh, how to do this. Uh, I'm going to recommend that you learn how, because it's actually kind of awesome. And then I'm going to suggest when you might want to not. So uh, step one is just to do it once. There's no trick to this. Anytime somebody says there's no trick, they always end up saying, but it's just hard work. And anybody who knows me knows that if it's hard work, I'm out. Um, <laughs> this, is not, this is not hard work, OK? It's really easy. All you have to do is have clear rules, uh, lower your standards, and then lower your epsilon. Um, Clear rules means you need an absolutely crystal clear definition because when the alarm cl clock goes off, or well, rather, when you wake up at 11.45 p.m. and you realize, I haven't shipped code today, you've only got 15 minutes to ship code today. You have to have a very clear rule that says, okay, I'm done, I win. I get to go back to bed, all right? So uh, for me, a clear rule was a working feature, okay? I'm glad Jim Wyrick isn't here because I did not have a rule that said they had to be tested. Um, well, which gets into the next point, which is lower your standards. Now. That's the funny version of lower your standards, but, but the serious version of lower your standards is, is um, if you stop and think, the thing that's going to stop me from shipping code every single day is that, well, it's just too hard, right? It's just, I mean, code is big, right? Okay, no. The reason code is big is because you have too high standards. You have decided that I can't ship this until I finish the account manager and the account class and the user class and the login class. and the No, one feature. Get it down, just one layer, one piece. Push it in. And that's also what I mean by epsilon. Epsilon is just a unit of work, a, a coherent thing that you would consider to be a commit or a check-in, something that you would be willing to push. As long as the project is coherent and your specs pass, you're golden. Okay? So epsilon, small unit of work. Okay? Uh, two years ago, uh, four, five years ago, actually, it was not uncommon for me to hold work for a week or more before pushing uh, up or, well, committing and subversion. Uh, two years ago, it was, uh, oh, usually I was daily. Uh, and now, honestly, it's rare that I go more than an hour or two without pushing. Um, so this is kind of a chain, that, 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 a change that happens to you as you start doing this, and it's very useful. Um, step two is just keep doing it. Don't break the chain. Go look up streaks, time management, or calendaraboutnothing.com, which is fantastic if you're doing this on GitHub. Just honor your commitment. At 11.45, get out of bed and go push your stupid code. Don't miss today. Don't break the chain, okay? Trick three, listen to your pain, okay? If it's 11.45 and you haven't got stuff and you don't know how you're going to get this done because you're freaking out, listen to yourself and ask, why? Okay, how, this is what I would end up doing. I'm like, why am I, have I not pushed code? I've, been, I've actually coded for six hours one day and then said, ah, screw it, and wrote a 15-minute thing and checked it in, okay? And threw away what I'd worked on for six hours. And then I stepped back and I, I kind of listened to myself. What was wrong? And that's kind of where I found out you need to lower your epsilon. You need to lower your standards and just do one feature at a time. Um, you will, oh, I recommend, this is just my suggestion, um, do it outside of work because you're going to work on work stuff every single day. You want this to be special. You want this to be something you have to get done that you're willing to get out of bed and go do. Um, if you just make it a habit every single day that you're going to get out of bed and do this this way, that's the way to do it. You're going to run out of ideas, so be open to new ones. Uh, look at Project Euler. Uh, tinker with your development environment. There's a bit, my, I have a project on GitHub called bin, and it's just the files that are in my bin directory, and it's like uh, just my git, ha my git hacks, all that kind of crap. Um, start projects. Just go for it. Um, that's really all there is to it. How long does it take to form a habit? Two weeks. Two, weeks, two, two to four weeks. Okay? This is going to take you 90 days. Because you're not forming a habit. You're not, you're not remembering to brush your teeth. You're building a mental tool. You need to do this. This is a fantastic tool to have on ship day when it's 845 and you're still stuck at the office. When you need to gear down into a lower gear and running granny gear, it's perfect for it. Um, but you should stop once you have this tool. Because only perfect practice makes perfect. And you're not going to have perfect practice. You're going to have practice building quick and dirty crap and getting it out the door, which is great at 845 PM, not so good at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. Uh, I recommend anybody take the time to learn this until you have the tool, and then I recommend you stop. Thanks.
All right, this presentation is on NoSQL, and SQL is a database toolkit for Ruby, and NoSQL is non-SQL databases, and NoSQL is using NoSQL databases with SQL. And I'm Jeremy Evans, the SQL maintainer. Now, MongoDB has a NoSQL document store, and SQL Mongo is a MongoDB driver for SQL. Now, how does this work? SQL uses a DSL instead of literal SQL strings. The DSL produces objects that represent concepts. We treat those objects specially in the SQL Mongo driver, and we compile filter objects to JavaScript instead of SQL. So let's see how this works. Again, you're just selecting records, select star from T, DB find in Mongo, same results. Inserting records, basically the same thing. SQLite gives you an integer primary key. Mongo gives you an object ID. Otherwise, pretty much the same thing. Uh, updating records, again, different incantations in the back end. Same SQL code works on both, same results. Deleting, delete in SQL, remove in Mongo. Pretty much the same thing, except Mongo gives you an integer that doesn't really mean anything. All right, let's add some more data and try things like ordering. Order by B descending. Again, works on SQLite, works on Mongo, same results. How about equals? Filter with a hash, A equals 5. In the Mongo, this.A equals equals 5. Same results. Not equals, pretty much the same thing. You have not equals, this.A not equals 5. Same results. Inequality, filter with a block. A greater than 5, again, pretty much the same thing on both SQLite and Mongo, same results. How about is null and not defined? You have A with a nil value in the hash. A is null in uh, SQLite. This.A equals equals undefined or not equals undefined. Otherwise, same results. Limits, again, limit two, limit two works the same way in Mongo, same results. Limit two with an offset, limit two skip one in Mongo, pretty much same results. Uh, how about selecting only certain columns? Um, in SQL, this is to select A from T, and Mongo, this is fields equals A. Pretty much the same results other than Mongo always gives you the object ID, um, even if you don't ask for it. Okay, counting, again, count star as count in SQLite. Mongo, just the count function, same results. Uh, standard math operators, A plus 1 times 5 minus B greater than 0. Again, works the same way in both SQLite and Mongo, same results. Bitwise math uh, operators, SQL can do bitwise shifts and bitwise ors if you tell it's a number. Again, same results. Let's add some strings to the table and see what we can, string operations we can do. I'm um, searching with regular expressions. This actually does not work on SQLite because it doesn't support regular expressions. It would work on MySQL and PostgreSQL and you get the same results Mongo gives you. Um, but you can, you actually, actually can use, use like, and SQLite just uses like. On Mongo, it compiles it to a regular expression, which it matches on, and you get the same results. String concatenation, SQL handles this. Um, basically, the same way it ha handles it on both um, SQLite and Mongo works the same way, gives the same results. Um, in, not in with an array. Um, C, in, Ali, and Alex. Um, in Mongo, it's Ali, Alex. Indes, index of this dot C not equals negative one or equals equals negative one for not in. Same results. Uh, complex expressions with ands and ors. Again, simple cases like simple or works fine. How about complex expression, nested ands and ors? Again, works fine. Um, very, very complex expressions. As complex as you can make it, there's no limit in terms of depth other than memory. Again, same results. Case statements, case A, 1, 5, then 0, 1, 1, then 9, else 1, end. Compiles it to a nested ternary expression in JavaScript, giving you the same results. Casting, cast A as varchar. This dot A plus the empty string converts it to a string in Mongo, same results. Again, for integers, you use minus zero, converts it to an integer in Mongo, same results. Models and attribute accesses with SQL model, again, works the same way, you get the same results on both, even works for associations. And uh, that's pretty much it. You can't have a NoSQL presentation without a completely flawed benchmark. So this is the completely flawed benchmark for NoSQL. And there's a bunch of numbers here, and they don't really mean anything. <laughs> and. Uh, that's it. Uh, SQL Mongo is available on GitHub, and no SQLs at that pace. And uh, do I have time for questions? Yeah. Questions? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Chad Woolley, work for Pivotal Labs. So let's start with the poll. Who writes tests? All right. Who thinks it's a good idea to keep your test green? Not the same number. How many of you use uh, continuous integration, which is some machine which runs your tests every time you check in code? OK. How many of you have a, a prominent visible display of that continuous integration in your work environment? All right. Pretty good. So that's what this is. Uh, Pivotal wrote this for internal use. We have all of our internal projects up on a, a huge uh, TV on multiple places in the office, so everybody knows when somebody's uh, project is broken. This is the public one that we have, and uh, it just runs several projects that we either wrote or use. Uh, as you can see, it's mostly green. We've open sourced this now. It's on GitHub. Feel free to, to use it and improve it. It only works with uh, CCRB now. 
And so that brings me to the, uh, the Rails CI. And so for probably a couple of years now, I've, as my contribution to Rails, tried to I set up a CI environment for them and tried to run it. But it's, uh, as you can see, it's not green. And, you know, that's a sad thing. So we'll look at the sad dog from here on out and just discuss. So why, why is that bad? Well, it's broken windows. You know, uh, somebody checks in something that breaks a build, and uh, that may be a minor test, but the next check-in may be something majorly broken, but you don't know because it's just red. You could go look at it, but, you know, you should need to know. And this notifies them in the campfire uh, room that they have for Rails Core, but it's hard for them to keep it green. Uh, why is it hard? Because CI ties everything together. It's pretty much everything comes together. It runs on most of the supported databases. It runs on the three interpreters, and not everybody tests that when they check in on, on the core team. So um, Rails Core, uh, especially Yehuda and Carl, who are great guys, by the way, want to keep this green, but they, they need help. They need your help. They need everybody's help. Uh, if you have an interest in Rails or CI or Ruby or, or anything. And this is also a great way, like if you're looking to get in open source, to get some Rails commits under your belt and grab that coveted position on the Rails committer list. You know, just uh, fix some things. All you need to do is watch CI. That's CI.Ruby on Rails. Um, if it goes red, try to fix it. Uh, patch it if you can. Ask for help if you can't. If, it, if it's gone for a while, Git bisect is your, your friend. It seems really hard, but it's not. It's really easy to sort of target exactly what broke something by using git bisect. Um, if you're confused, uh, first of all, you can email me, Chad Woolley, or email the Rails core list. On the, uh, you can also get on the Carl Huda IRC list, which bug them about it. There's also the Rails contrib list. I'll go back to the sad dog. And that's pretty much it. The, the environment needs some love, especially the Ruby 1.9. Um, I set it up about a year ago, and the, it kind of dies sometimes. It's, CCRB is just a single mongrel. Uh, if a bunch of people hit it with RSS, which happened, it kind of kills it. I, I have some caching in my branch, but... Uh, I haven't set it up. My original goal was for this to be completely reproducible. So anybody could set this up on a virtual machine or an EC2 instance and basically eliminate the, the excuse, oh, well, it only breaks on CI. So I wanted to have this thing that, okay, you run this one bash command against some host name that is a, a bare Ubuntu or Debian instance, and you'll end up with a working rail CI. And I, I wrote a like a bootstrap Ruby script and CI in a box, and, and that was really a flawed approach. And now there's RVM and Chef, which you heard about today, which are way more awesome ways to do this. But I haven't done it yet, so help with that would also be very welcome. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Let, let's, uh, you know, especially since if, if you're working on Rails and you're interested in Rails and you have an interest in things or want to get a patch on your belt, help out. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to show off uh, something I've been working on for the past couple of weeks with uh, a couple guys up there, Joe and Jake. It's a, uh, you can check it out, the internet sucks, but it's at memprof.com slash demo. It's basically a web-based uh, heap visualizer and leak analyzer for uh, 1.8 right now. We're working on 1.9 support. But uh, you, get, you get a bunch of views, and uh, I'm just going to walk through some interesting things, and if anybody has questions or specific things they want to look at, we can look at them real quick. But uh, there's three basic views. There's namespace, uh, subclasses, and grouping. And you basically, this is, a, this is a dump of uh, a simple script uh, that just requires all of standard lib and then just dumps out the heap. And so you can see a lot of interesting things in here. Uh, let's go to, for instance, the subclasses view. Uh, we can see the root object is object. Um, and there's a bunch of subclasses. You can see what the subclasses of array that are defined in your uh, in your process are. Uh, we can look at stuff like exception and the entire exception hierarchy 
in Ruby. Um, so you can get a sense of what's on your heap, and if you find stuff that's not supposed to be there, you can get rid of it and save some memory. Uh, but the, the real power in here is that you can actually analyze uh, different objects. So for instance here, if I click on CGI, I can see that CGI has a bunch of constants. It has no instances in this case. Uh, there's a bunch of methods defined on it. It has a meta class. We can look at this meta class. Meta class, uh, you get even more information about it. There's methods defined on the meta class. Um, and basically anything you can click on. So here we can click on CGI.RB and take a look at all of the objects that are defined inside that file. We can group them either by line or by type. Here we see there's some classes. We could click on class and drill down and see the actual classes defined in that file. Um, so this is pretty useful for finding memory leaks or uh, finding out what's holding onto references. Here's another example. Uh, we could take a look at threads. The thread class we see in this case there's two instances. Um, the first one happens to be the main thread and the second one happens to have been allocated in timeout.rb. Um, so you get a lot of power. Uh, I want to show off one quick example. This is actually Bundler. Uh, Carl asked me a couple weeks ago why, uh, if I could help figure out why Bundler was taking up so much memory. Uh, so this is just a heap dump. You can see there's 500,000 objects. I group by file and um, this file has the most number of objects so we can drill down into that file. We see there's about 50,000 objects. They all have to be gem version objects. So we can click on that, get a list of all of them, click on one of them and see, uh, click on the references tab and try to get a sense of what's holding a reference to this gem version object. And you can basically drill down and see that um, Bundler has this thing called remote specification, um, each of which holds a reference to a gem version. Those are held in hashes and arrays in the Bundler index. Uh, and you can basically see anything you want about these objects. Um, so in this case, um, the bundler index holds on to an instance variable add specs, which is basically a huge hash. In this case, 10,000 entries in this hash. Uh, and basically, it's all the gems on RubyForge. It has to download it and populate the hash so it can do lookups and figure out what gems to install or download. Uh, and that's why it's using so much memory in this case, because there's this huge hash that's holding on to a lot of references. Um, so this is Memprof. Um, Check it out, it's up. Uh, we have a, uh, a little survey we just put up that um, if you have time, please fill out. We're just trying to get a sense of what Ruby's people use, what sort of problems they've run into, and what sort of features they would like to see in this. Um, and finally, Joe's gonna have a talk tomorrow uh, that explains in a lot of detail how Memprof works and uh, should be pretty interesting. Any questions? <laughs> cool. Hello, my name is uh, Jade Meskill. I'm the founder, um, and I don't have video. Let's see. Uh, we'll, start over. we'll get it. This doesn't count. Okay. Do over. Do over. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's try this again. Uh, my name is Jade Meskill. I'm the founder of Integrum Technologies. We're a, a Phoenix-based Ruby on Rails and iPhone consulting shop. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you guys about is um, how many of you guys have had to do user-generated video on a site? How many of you hate yourself? Like, it's, it's hard, right? It, it's kind of a pain in the butt. And uh, one of our clients is uh, Sorensen Media, who's based here in Salt Lake City. And they have a really awesome uh, system for video distribution as well as uh, in-browser video capture. And what I want to show you guys real quick is we, we built a little video wall uh, for Mountain West, and I built it in a few minutes with uh, a few lines of, of Ruby. And I want to show you guys just how, how stupid simple uh, it was to implement. Um, th there's two gems out there that Sorensen has. One is for their product called Squish, which is uh, a, a Java applet that runs in your browser that will capture user-generated video from your webcam or other cameras that you plug in. It will compress it client side in the browser and then upload the compressed version to either your own server or they have a, a system called uh, 360, which is their video distribution network. Um, so this little guy here sets up the new view. And the internet is very brutally slow, so you might have to bear with me. I'm on my uh, MiFi. Uh, sets up this which uh, gets ready to capture some video so let's let's capture a little video real quick 
This is eating into my time. Um, all right, come on. Here we go. Here I am. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. I'm at Mountain West RubyConf. Yay. All right, short little video. We capture that. Uh, I can preview it and trim it down and do all kinds of fun things. I'm going to process that video. It's going to upload it to Sorensen's uh, 360 service, and then it's going to post back to my Rails app that I built. Uh, and I'll show you that code real quick while we're waiting for that to post. Um, I have it going to a secondary step, which is this finish right here. Can you guys see that? So this, this uses the Sorensen gem to go out using the GUID, gets all the metadata from 360, pulls it down, and now I have, oh great, and the internet failed. Well, what, what should have happened, and I've uploaded my handsome face here multiple times, um, is it will give me thumbnails, uh, URLs to the video, uh, all, an embed code that I can easily reuse to just plug it into this view here. Um, you know, to play the video, we can see that. Uh, and all of that happens from these two lines of code. So it's super stupid, simple, easy way to get user-generated video for your clients, your websites, whatever you need to do. Uh, just a few lines of Ruby and you're up and running. And this literally took me about 10 minutes. Uh, the hardest part was stealing the CSS from the Mountain West site and re-implementing it on my own. Any questions? I don't know how much time we've got. I got a minute. All right, thank you very much. Oh, there's a question back there. What's that? An example? Yeah, oh, oh that's, that's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to developer.sorensenmedia.com to learn more about the API. And also, dun, 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 this is posted up on mountainwest.integramdemo.com. Uh, I'll put uh, all the stuff up on GitHub. Mike's going to put a link on the Mountain West site. Uh, it's up now, okay. And uh, Sorensen is giving away free accounts for developers to test. Uh, so you can sign up on developer.sorensenmedia.com, and if you email mflathers at sorensenmedia.com, he will uh, upgrade your account and give you guys a little bit more access for free. Uh, yep. Uh, supports Flash and MP4. Yeah. So it'll it'll reencode all kinds of other videos. All right, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to talk about HTML5 today, but what I'm actually talking about is offline. Um, specifically, when I'm talking about offline, I don't mean only apps that need to run offline. I mean apps, I mean reducing downloads in general. So something that Carl and I noticed uh, when we were, we're looking at putting out some mobile thing, um, some like toolkit library thing. You'll hear more about it, I'm sure, eventually. Um, one of the things that annoyed us was that a lot of people who make mobile sites like uh, i. the unofficial app weblog com they're officially mobile sites, but every time you go to a page, it actually downloads all the HTML again, even though they're be running on devices that don't require that. And when we started to investigate why that was, we talked to a lot of people who were doing mobile devices, mobile development. What we discovered was that most people don't actually know how to do it. So what I'm going to show you is how to do it, and then eventually we will hopefully have something that makes it really easy. But uh, the technique is not very hard by itself. So first of all, here is the HTML that gets downloaded when you go to unofficial Apple web blog. It's like 6K. Um, every single time you go to a site, it has to do that. Not only that, but before it can show anything, like a loading screen or anything like that, it has to go and ask for HTML. So it has to open HTTP connection. If you have flaky internet, like... You, should, you would think, oh, I already have all the stories. Why don't I just want to see a story that I already saw before? No, you can't do that because it's actually just doing regular client-server model where everything is click on a link, go download the whole page every time. Now, they try to make it light. 6K is pretty small for a page, but that doesn't include the assets and all that. So it's basically just like bad news, essentially. Um, even if you just go look at the part of it that's the, the list of stories, it's this huge glob of HTML. It's a list with 
LIs and AHREFs and spends, right? So there's a, a lot more content here than, would, than you would think would be necessary to just deliver some stories to an iPhone. Um, the trick is that instead of having, instead of going and having it get the whole page, you do a normal request, an HTTP request. Um, you accept application JSON. Um, I'll show in a second what the JavaScript code looks for that. And then in your controller, you do something like this. This, this works in Rails 3. In Rails 2, you would say respond to and JSON and whatever. But basically, you just have your controller like your normal controller. And instead of returning HTML, you return JSON. This is like the normal way that you do APIs. right? So nothing really amazing here. Um, it, that returns a blob that looks like this. So you end up with just a blob of JSON. Again, if you are done APIs with Rails, this is exactly what happens, right? So you're just basically having the web application treat your Rails application as a, a server. And people are already doing this. this is not, even in like regular desktop, this is a common technique. Um, the jQuery for this is simple. Um, don't worry, I'm going to get to like the tying it all together in a minute. The jQuery is, is simple. Basically, you just you have some stock HTML, and you go do get JSON slash articles. There's a JSON that comes back, and you go in and you update. You have a little template HTML that you up, you fill in with the slots, and then you append it to the page, right? So this is like a normal, you've probably done stuff like this in regular desktop applications. The thing that makes this cool and work well for mobile is two things. First of all, there's this thing called the cache manifest. The cache manifest is just something you put in HTML. You say HTML manifest equals, this is an example from the spec. Um, Cache manifest is just a list. Of, it has to have the word cache manifest in it for some reason. Um, and then it's a, a list of things that you should act, that the client should for sure keep. So these are things that no matter what, the client will not ask for again. So if, you're, if you've seen like the Yahoo thing that's like, you can only have 25K, jQuery is too big, and like you're freaking out that it's going to be downloading all the time, the solution is just to tell the client, don't do that. Always download every single time. And you put all your assets in here, right? Then you have to serve it with text slash cache manifest. Rails obviously knows how to do that. So just make sure that you have a route that points at cache manifest, and you're serving a thing with text slash cache manifest with the valid text. So that's step number one, that means that when the user comes back to your site in, in a flaky mode, they'll see an actual page that has stuff in it, right? As opposed to nothing, because they're, they have no internet. Or nothing, because it's taking like 45 seconds to download the HTML the first time. The second piece is local storage. Um, so local storage is just an API that comes with HTML5. You basically want to do something like this. You want to say, hey, articles equals local storage that articles. And then if I have any articles, then update articles, and then do a JSON.parse. You display a loader, and then in either case, you get new articles. So right away, you already have any articles that you've already downloaded that will show up in your screen, and you say, go get more. Update articles is simple. It's basically exactly what we had before, but it takes JSON that now you can pull out of local storage. Get articles is the same get JSON we had before. right? So basically what you have now is you have the ability to have something that shows up right away. You have the ability to pull the actual content out of a local storage that's sitting on your, on your phone that isn't going to actually get wiped away when the user like clicks off the page. Um, and you have the ability to display a loader while you're possibly getting more information. And I think this technique, I, OK, I'll just, can I finish my sentence? Um, this technique is uh, easy enough to de demonstrate on a few slides. I think there's a lot, there's some work that's necessary to put it all together in a Rails plugin that would make it easy. But I think that this is how people should be doing iPhone web apps, not always displaying HTML. Okay, thank you. Sweet. All right, so I'm going to show off some fun stuff I've been doing with e commerce lately, which is a total lie because I hate dealing with e-commerce all the time, so I don't really think it's fun. Um, so on, my, on a couple projects recently, I've been playing around with Active Merchant. And most people are familiar with Active Merchant. It's very popular for doing e-commerce in your apps. Um, I got sick and tired of doing some of the really, the, main, the mundane tasks that it doesn't take care of. Like I wanted my apps to be up and running and be able to accept credit cards in a minute or so. Um, sure, maybe the credit card form will look icky. I'll add my CSS and things to it later. But I wanted things like that. By the way, if I run out of time, all my code that I'm going to do will be up at GitHub, Remy presentations. There's a Mountain West RubyConf 2010 lightning talk there. So, And this app we're going to be looking at is actually a Rack middleware for doing e commerce -y stuff. It's called Rack Payment, github.com, devfu, Rack Payment. So, what I've already got is a buy stuff Sinatra application, which just has a hash of products. If we go and look at what the app looks like, we've got a sombrero for sale and some oatmeal. Thank you. Um, so we'd like people to be able to buy this. All we've got so far, oops, 
is the home page, Hamel products, and uh, a product page that when we go to one, all it does is blow up and it should show us some information like the products hash and some params. I'm actually using a little gem called Tracy that Andy Farah, who's sitting over there, made like an hour ago, and that's where this trace comes from. So what we really want to do is, based on the product, actually get the cost and charge someone that amount of money. Here's products. It looks like just a hash. So we can use the name of the product. And let's trace. Let's just raise at products. Uh, name and make sure we get something. Boop. All right, uh, the sombrero costs 1995. So what we want to do is we want to say that the payment amount that we want to process is equal to that thing that I just deleted. So payment dot amount equals, and you're wondering where payment comes from. Uh, nowhere because we haven't put it anywhere. So this is when we want to require rack payment. You can install the gem rack dash payment. And what we want to do in Sinatra is add some helper methods. Let's say helpers and include rack payment methods. Refresh that puppy. Now it's pissed off because it's looking for things. We haven't actually included the middleware. So let's reuse rack payment. You need to pass some, option, uh, some options along. So it accepts things like your gateway. This might be something like authorized net or PayPal with your username and password and API key. We're going to use the built-in bogus gateway that Active Merchant comes with that just sort of fakes a normal gateway. OK, and now all we're seeing is the amount, because that's what we returned. So how do we actually process this? Well, with Rack Payment to help you get up and running really quickly, all you need to do is after setting the amount, you want to return a payment required status code. There's actually an HTTP status code for that. It's 402. Uh, it asks us if we have enabled some kind of uh, session middleware, because that's required. We haven't, so session cookie. And then let's try that again. And it gives us some pre-formatted thing, um, which is what we want if we want payment today up and running immediately. Of course, everything's custom, you know, customizable. Um, let's see, amount and cents, da 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 da. I'll go back and try this again. We want the sombrero. Complete the purchase. Oh, why is it sad? Right, payment methods. You and your smartness over there, Mr. Man. I got 30 seconds left. Woo! Let's buy something. Complete purchase. Oh, we're all so sad. Oh no, we've got 20 seconds. Let's restart Shotgun in case it's mad at us. We actually set the amount, which should actually be a float. Return status. Sometimes Sinatra wants us to say some kind of text for that response. Buy the sombrero, please. Please. Oh, okay. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, no. Wah, wah, goes the alarm. That was an invalid credit card number for the gateway. If we give it one. Oh, no. Oh, no. That would have worked. If you want to check it out, it's kind of alpha, but it's actually being used in production in some sites. And um, yeah, you usually don't get those kind of errors in production. Your mom's site. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, hi. Managing projects with GNU Screen. What is it? No. 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 It's this. Uh, it's a terminal multiplexer. Lets you um, do cool stuff. Um, why do you want to use GNU Screen? You can split your screen. If you drop your connection, if you're working on a server, your uh, connection drops. Uh, it persists. It's cool. Um, you can also hack like in the movies. Now, Screen Manager, uh, Screen Manager builds on top of uh, GNU Screen. It's uh, just a bunch of con uh, config files. Why do you want to use it? Um, if you use different versions of Ruby with your projects, this would be helpful. 
like um, if you start services, um, MongoDB, MySQL, D, RabbitMQ, etc., you might want it. Or if you're using macOS's OS's uh, TENS terminal app, you can't name your tabs, and that makes me sad. Uh, okay, live demo. Okay, let's hope it goes well. Okay, so I'll get a bigger. We've got three minutes left. Okay, I'm doing good. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, clone the template. Gives me a bunch of files. Um, just check out um, Ruby 1.9. So this will load a screen session that's automatically initialized to use Ruby 1.9.1. Um, right now, I'm 1.8.6. So Rails my project. And if I want to make a screen session for uh, my project, I'm just going to create the file. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load Ruby 1.9, and I need to make the font size bigger again. Can you see it? OK, load Ruby 1.9. And then I want to um, set my caption. Uh, that's big and ugly, but the Ruby variable gets, environment variable gets set so I can have the Ruby in there. And then I want it to start MongoDB and script server and maybe Spork and console and bash. So, oh, I also have to set uh, my root environment variable. That just tells uh, screen where to go. Um, so look at this command right here. It says stuff. This is stuffing key presses into the screen or the bash session. And backslash 015, that represents a return key. Uh, so clear on that. If I save this and I fire up screen manager with my project, I get a screen session. I've got MongoDB running. And I have script server running. Well, I would, but you see it typed it in. Um, I didn't want that to launch right away, so it just typed it for me. I just have to hit enter, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you can use it. Uh, thank you. Oh, wait, there's more. Sorry. Can I get one of them? Yep. Uh, there's the URL, github.com, screen manager. There's in instructions. Uh, computer's not included. And uh, that's me. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Brendan O'Connor. I'm engineer, honest to God, for Dirty Tricks at Symbol Geo. Um, and I want to talk to you about a small problem we've been facing over the last couple of months. So we were working on a variety of different interesting projects. And we're like, well, we want to build all these cool games, right? We want to have games like World of Warcraft except in real life. We want to be able to walk around and like I'm an orc and I, I don't actually play World of Warcraft. So you're an elf and I pull up my sword and I kill you except like in real life, not just screwing around. And because it's way more fun, right? Because admittedly, this will get the nerds out of the basement and up under the streets, which may not be a good idea, but we thought it'd be fun. And so we tried to start building this, and we had this problem, which is that we have these wonderful tools, like we have Heroku, and we have uh, Rails in the cloud for NGDR. And the thing is, this is all well and good, except if you want to do anything that's geotagged, um, because all these tools don't really seem to actually do, give us any kind of geo infrastructure. We could set it up ourselves, but it turns out to be really difficult. If you want to do anything with geo, you have to go to somebody like Esri. And do you see the prices up there? Do we have this large enough for you to see that this is kind of a sticker shock issue? And for a small startup or just any random individual developers, we have a slight problem that this is more than we have. So this isn't really good. The other alternative for GIS stuff and any kind of data is PostgreGIS, which is great, except that it doesn't scale. All these solutions tend to fall over once you get more than one cluster. And so we decided we had to build our own solution, and then we were going to make it so that it would actually scale and that everybody could build games to get nerds out of basements. And so we developed Simple Geo. 
And so, you know, and we have lots of great marketing copy, but essentially what this is, it, it's Heroku, except it's just for Geo stuff. We have four-dimensional querying, so yes, that's like X, Y, and altitude, and time querying for all sorts of cool Geo things. And why should you care? Why is this not just astroturfing? Well, for one thing, we're using every kind of cool new hotness thing. We have an actual RESTful interface. But much more importantly, we have a bajillion open source libraries, and this is something you can start hacking on right now. Not only is it free for developers within a huge amount of actual data stored in, but we have access to a huge amount of data that you can't get, like the Twitter fire hose. Everything that's geotagged coming from Twitter, we have, you can access it all immediately. But in addition, we have actual people, not just you know, random nerds in our basement, hacking on this thing and launching actual whole companies on this in the middle of the thing. You might have heard about Sticky Bits, which launched on Monday. Sticky Bits is built entirely on our infrastructure, and so they turned on an extra couple thousand queries a minute, and we're like, ah, it's fine. But in addition, we have cool iPhone apps. And yes, and all of this code is free, and you can all go play with it. But in addition, we know that there are some really uncool people who, rather than coming to a, Rail, a Ruby conference this weekend, decided to go someplace to Austin and do something I don't really understand. And so if you really want to tr track what they're all up to, we have this wonderful thing. You can check out Austin vicariously. And so what you can actually do, and we built this in like a day or two, is you can see every, t every single thing that's geotagged, every bump, every Gowalla check it, every flicker, every tweet, et cetera. Etc. I can bore you with details all day that comes in as it comes in live and so you can see that whoa there are a lot of nerds there and they have too many iPhones and so therefore you're able to do all this this is something you guys can start working on at the Hackfest tonight if you were looking for a project and thought well you know Geo would be cool but I wanted to set up three weeks spend three weeks setting up Postgre GIS instead you can come do this we're going to open beta next week but if you want to get a beta key just come grab me I'm fairly distinctive. I have, you know, hugely long hair. And so you can get a beta key tonight, start hacking on our open source libraries tonight, and do awesome stuff with Geo. <laughs> Questions? Anybody? I signed up for the beta a long time ago. So, okay. So we had, uh, like, I think 15,000 developers sign up for the beta. Uh, ping me after this, and I'll get you in right now. It's real easy. Yeah. We have looked at OpenStreetMaps. We're going there, I think, next week, actually. Um, we're just hooked into this. This is, this is the visualization that I was able to do this. I did this by myself in a day or two. I mean, <laughs> like, this is really, it really is that easy. Do we have something terrible going on? I didn't even, it's a tweet. Okay, well, that's the thing, of course. You play with the live data, you get what you deserve, I suppose. Anybody else? Okay, if you want to play with this, see me after the talk. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacques. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, an app uh, that's not yet built, but is being built. And uh, hopefully I'd like to get your help at today's Hackfest on getting it done. Uh, it's called Rails Gen. Um, basically what it is is uh, Rails Boost++. Plus plus. Um, it's uh, focused on Rails 3. Uh, it has more, more options. Uh, I try to go a lot further with like integrating designs, web servers, uh, middle, middleware. Um, and even uh, kind of initializing deployment and stuff. So you can just start a new app and, uh, you know, get all that stuff really quick. Um, it's also more social. You can vote up the stuff you like. You can comment on stuff, and you can start a nice flame war about why one component's better than the other. Uh, you can also uh, collect stacks, uh, create them, um, and we sort of also track, like, if you use it from a certain URL, will track that you used it at that time. So you have like a history so you can see, okay, I used that, I want to use it again. Um, and you can fork, modify, and everything. Uh, and this is basically the same, uh, same usage as Rails Boost. You just uh, use it from uh, the command line. Uh, we use subdomains. That's probably the only difference. Um, one cool thing is you don't have to actually go to the website. Uh, you can just start using them. Uh, we, the, the subdomain we parse, so if you just add, say, AR plus ERB plus prototype, uh, we'll find all those things and then generate it on the fly uh, as soon as you request it. Um, those are some examples there. And the development stack, it's, uh, it's all open source. That's the, uh, the URL. Um, uh, uses Rails 3, uh, SAS, uh, Mongo Mapper, hosted on Heroku and uh, launching tomorrow with your help. Um, I'll be at the Hackfest. If anybody wants to help out, get a sense for you know, Rails 3, Mongo Mapper and stuff, it would be a good project to uh, play around with those stuff. And anybody who contributes, uh, we'll get on the credits page on the site. Thanks a lot.
thanks. <clears throat> My name is uh, Chris Smith. I'm a Rails developer. I live in Salt Lake. Um, I spent about a year and a half with Ruby and Rails professionally. Before that, I worked in Java, <clears throat> and uh, I guess about seven or eight years. <clears throat> and uh, I had a really interesting experience moving from Java to Rails, or to Ruby, and I wanted to talk about it and also um, present the the small open source project that I've done to try to address the situation I came across personally. So um, in Java, it was pretty uh, moderately hardcore uh, test-first developer. And I say moderately because um, I've always been fascinated with the sort of the, the human factor in programming, you know? Like, if you're not doing the, the right thing, the thing that everybody thinks is right and you think you actually believe is right yourself, um, <clears throat> there might be a reason for it that's good, there might be a reason that's bad. It could have to do with um, not having the right short-term incentives, uh, not having the right incentives, period, or uh, just a question of self-discipline or habit, all that kind of stuff. And I've always um, looked at myself as sort of my own, uh, my own case study or guinea pig. So the first thing I did with test-driven development years ago was I decided I want to get over the habit question. So I just forced myself to do it for a long time. Um, and that, that gets you pretty far. Uh, uh, part of that process, I think, is also reducing the barriers. So it, it was a matter of getting um, tools in place, you know, so that your startup time, uh, if you want to start writing tests, it should be almost instant, you know. If you want to run them, it should be instant. You should, you should try to cut down any barrier that you run into that keeps you from doing this thing you're, you're testing as an idea of what the right thing to do is. Okay, so. Um, I was doing really well as a test, a TDD person, you know, and um, always firing up JUnit or something like that to write tests. See, uh, first of all, um, the classic reason to sort of like design through testing, define an interface from the client's point of view, that kind of stuff. But secondly, uh, also just to explore code, you know, so I'd be sitting with somebody um, on my team and they would be trying to. Um, understand a, a complicated library like a date library, you know, and testing it out through the application, through the web app. And I'd say, wait, 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 come on, come on. We can do this another way. We can write little tests. It'll tell us right away. It's better than even reading the documentation sometimes. We'll just, you know, fire up JUnit. We'll start writing some tests for Java Util Calendar. And we'll see what the thing actually does. Let the computer answer the question in fractions of a second. So um, I always had this great motivation with legacy code, you know, new projects I came across, uh, libraries I didn't understand, lots of things to try to uh, close the feedback loop as tightly as possible and write tests. And then sometimes some of these tests were worth keeping or they got moved into, into the production code. You know, you puzzle something out and then you move it into a method and you move it into your production code and you keep the test. But, Anyway, a lot, of, a lot of good testing came out of that. Not the majority, not as much as if you're designing, doing it test first, but certainly if you're coming onto a project late and you spend a few weeks getting to know it by writing tests, you get a lot of tests out of it. And some of them are good to have. Thanks. Well, um, so when I came to Rails and Ruby, I discovered the console and all that motivation evaporated. I'm like, this is better. I'm swimming in the code. I'm in it. And the only thing that was missing was anything afterward. Uh, the, that 5% of expressions you might write that you actually wanted to keep or capture in some kind of test weren't there. So that's what uh, this project, which I've been working on for a few weeks, is about. Um, it's simply a test recorder for IRB. And uh, if you look at my test um, IRB, it just requires Ruby gems and butterfly net. Type IRB, uh, load it like this. Give a name. Um, start with a variable. Uh, maybe expression in here. And we'll just exit. Well, um, you know, I, it, you can you can tell it when to. You can just type an M. Uh, and tell it when to make a new method, but in this case, it's just one method. And you can run it, and then work. That's it. 
Oh, I need help. I need help. This is, right now, you know, like, the fact that it doesn't do an assert around the variable assignment, that kind of stuff is based on regular expressions. Um, it, it doesn't have a, you know, it doesn't really parse the code. I could use some help. Uh, here's my email. Uh, get in touch with me. Go I'll go to the Hackfest. I'll be there. All right. Thanks. Uh, this is not exactly Ruby. Um, it's a it's a project that I personally think is freaking awesome. Um, this is a, a language called Coffee Script. Okay, it's uh, it's basically just a a syntax that compiles down to JavaScript. Okay, so every statement in Coffee Script uh, compiles straight down to JavaScript. Uh, it gives you a lot of nice things, like a lot of nice operators, like extends, for example. Um, uh, you know, it, the, the fact that it, it's got a lot of similarities to Ruby, which is why I'm talking about it here. Like, every, every method has a return value, and you don't even have to say return. You know what I'm saying? That, that kind of stuff that comes from Ruby, like everything is an expression, right? Um, it's got, um, let, me, let me just show you kind of some, some little code that I wrote here, which was kind of, uh, you, you kind of see some similarities to Ruby, right? So we've got a class here called Sombrero, which is ridiculous. And then it's got a, a method called Dawn, right? Here's how we know it's a method. Ding! Uh, what happens when we Dawn the Sombrero? Uh, then we've got a person class, right? Here we've got our little methods. We've got our instance variables. These look like Ruby, right? We've got a method declaration without, uh, you know, the little the little parens for the for the uh, you know uh, for the argument list. Uh, and then you know we've got uh, like if statements here. This looks a lot like Ruby, you know, without using your parens for your for your you know true false testing here. Um, we're extending here. Uh, we've got super capabilities. I mean, this is this is like phenomenal stuff. If you're talking about when you're talking about JavaScript, like JavaScript, I'm sorry, but it, it I hate it. Like, no, I love it. Like, I do a lot of it, but it's kind of like because I'm have to because that's I don't have any choice. But anyway, uh, CoffeeScript. So it's like right now it's just for fun, right? It's just like yeah, this is kind of fun to add this. Uh, uh, this you know syntax, but then you look, it compiles straight down to JavaScript, right? So the JavaScript code is kind of nasty. You have to do like because you know JavaScript doesn't really have extends, so you kind of have to do this. But I mean, it totally runs. You know, olay. Uh, so uh, you know, it's it shares a lot of similarities with Ruby. The the probably the coolest thing about this project is the lexer and the grammar are written in CoffeeScript. So it, it actually compiles itself. So it's like, yeah, dude, like, usually when I'm, like, playing around and I have something for fun, like, I don't go to those lengths, you know, like, to actually write a lexer for my own for fun language, like, you know? Um, and we're talking about, like, we're talking about documentation. Check out the documentation on this project. We've got uh, the inline documentation is, is pulled out right here, and then you've got, like, the code right next to it. Here, by the way, this is the grammar file that's written in CoffeeScript. Um, so it's an amazing language, compiles straight down to JavaScript. You know, there are a couple of other people doing like things like this, like uh, the Objective J project, in, in you know, in particular, comes to mind. Uh, the only drawback with that project is everything is actually lexed and parsed at runtime, right? If, uh, this language will compile straight down to JavaScript because every statement compiles to JavaScript, right? So you compile it ahead of time and then the client just downloads the JavaScript, right? So it's, it's actually faster. You don't have like the spinning thing that you see when you get cappuccino apps. I'm a big fan of cappuccino, but I'm just saying it seems to me like this is a little bit nicer approach. Anyway, uh, it uses JSON for its compiling, which is kind of like a JavaScript Bison. But anyways, CoffeeScript, check it out. I'm seriously loving in this language, and uh, I think Ruby hackers would, would really dig it as well. So, Oh. All right. Hey, everybody. So we're going to create an uh, app engine app real quick. What do you guys want to call it? Oh. I'm going to call it Mountain West Ruby Conf Demo, because I... Oh, hey, look, that's available. 
So uh, I'm logged in as some user that's not really me called JRuby4U. So uh, hopefully that will work. And it said, hey, you've got a dashboard. Great. So I've got a dashboard. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to, uh, can you guys see this? So if you were to install uh, the gem by typing sudo gem install Google App Engine, you could say app config uh, generate app, and I'm going to call it Mountain West Ruby Conference Demo. Oops. Okay, so what it's doing here is it's uh, going to create a folder called Mountain West Ruby Conference Demo. It's going to copy over some jar files that I need out of my MRI gem area, and then it's going to uh, parse my rackup file that I generated to generate some XML files that I don't want to look at. And now it's going to, oh, there it is. So if I go here, uh, oops, I should probably see you in that directory. So I've got a uh, config file here that says hello. And if I run that under the dev app server, it's a local Java, basically a Jetty server running. Uh, so I get a server without uh, having to install it. There, it's running a local host. So there it is. It says hello, hopefully. Yeah, so that's the app that I created. Now if I want to publish it, I would type something else. I'm going to type control C. I'm going to type uh, app config uh, update. And because I haven't done anything as this fake user, it's going to hopefully, if I have some bandwidth, connect. Yeah, there it goes. It's saying I'm using all the gem. I'm going to log in as that user. And as long as I'm using uh, Java 1.6, it will not echo my password. So if you see your password being echoed, you probably want to switch. OK, so now it's uh, updating the app. And if I were to go back to uh, it's deploying. OK, so there it goes. Now if I go to my dashboard, I can see I have a bunch of things in here like versions. I have a version of it running. Here's the latest version. And it's loading. Now how much time do I have left? What's that? More than a minute. Okay, more than a minute. So, okay, so I'm not sure what it's doing there, but you know, while it's doing that, so there's my app. It says hello, it's in production. I don't know if you guys can see. It's basically showing the latest one. But since I have one minute, maybe I should publish a Rails app. I don't know. I could probably do that in a minute. So if I want to do that, I have a little instructions here. There's a curl script that you download, and if I paste that in here, it's going to download my little script that says, go grab some files you need to patch in and then also run Rails. Uh, and there it goes. So I basically just installed a bunch of gems. You can see I'm using Data Mapper. It's packaging the gems right now. It basically is taking Bundler and saying, Bundler, go grab all those gems, stick them in one jar file, and throw it in my uh, webinf directory. So the gems are actually installed into the app. And as long as I have time here, I can publish this. Now I could also create a controller with scaffolding, and it'll work with, uh, with uh, my uh, validations and stuff like that. So now it's actually, it's actually firing up JRuby to parse my uh, config.ru because it, uh, it needs to use Java sometimes to do that because I can put middleware in my config.ru. OK, there it goes. I'm going to publish it real quick. So I just generated the Rails app, and now I'm going to update it again. Oops, you know what? I need to do this. Oops, I'm not really control seed yet. I need to change this to say Mountain West Ruby Conference because I blew away the old one I had. Oh. Okay. All right, so I changed the uh, configure U. The configure U, I don't know if you guys saw it really quick. It basically has some middleware that says, my app's called this, and it has this version, and it also calls the, uh, the Rails. Uh, 
dispatcher. Um, we decided to stick everything in the configureru. So you do all your configuration in configureru. We parse that. We then generate the XML files you need. If you go touch the XML files, we'll just blow them away anyway. We don't want you in there. There's nothing to look at. So now it's republishing the app, and it's uh, it shouldn't take too long because it is. Um, it's going to basically look at all the jars and stuff that I have and do a checksum on them and upload ones it's never seen before and since I've published other apps. It's possible that I'm just having to wait for it to configure uh, this pre-verification stuff that we do. So we'll wait for it. What's that? Okay. So uh, there's actually something that's going on here that's kind of interesting. Anytime you have Java code in your application, the files get uploaded and it pre-compiles them for you and, and sort of validates them. And so that doesn't have to happen while the app's spinning up. Also, it copies anything that's in your public uh, directory off to a set of caching servers. So you just deploy your app like you normally would and, and don't worry about uh, pushing it off. You know what? I think I may have... Uh, if you pub sometimes when you publish and you stop, it, it gets messed up. Well, anyway, so are you thinking our network is like hung up? Yeah, so I have no network. Told you. Okay, well, anyway, that's all you have to do. All right, guys, that's it. Thank you very much.